equipment and settings. So when it comes to my wedding photography, my kit, my, my equipment, I really do like to keep it to an absolute minimum. And remember, this kit is going to stay with you all day. No matter where you go, you've always got to keep it with you. Whether that's at the side of you in kind of a, a wheel up bag or maybe in a backpack on your back. But you want to keep it in your sight at all times. There is nothing worse than turning around and your bag's gone and you don't know where it's gone. And even if the venue's just moved it or put it to one side, it, it starts heart palpitations. And let's face it, at any one time, you're probably carrying around about £10,000 in that bag. So it's, it's really important uh, to keep it as light as possible. And that also comes into another scenario where if you have a lot of kit, if you're one of those photographers that you carry around everything you own, now all you're going to do is, if it's a backpack, nine times out of 10, you'll just pick it up and you'll throw it onto one shoulder. Now what you're doing is you're putting a lot of pressure on that one shoulder. And trust me, I know I've had operations on the malignants in my shoulder just because of this. Because you're pulling all that pressure down, you're actually, you're hurting your malignants in your shoulder and this will cause problems in the long run. Also, same with a camera. If you're throwing it over your shoulder and you've got two cameras, say you're doing a 10 hour wedding, then by the end of the night, you feel drained, your shoulders ache. So we want to eliminate as much weight as possible off our shoulders and either onto our hips or into a bag that stays on the ground. Now I've been through multiple bags and if anyone knows me, they know I am an absolute lover of camera bags. I've had shoulder bags, small, medium and large. I've had backpacks of all sizes. I've had uh, roller bags of all different makes and models. I I've tried them all. I generally have. But over the years, it's brought me to one bag and I've actually owned this bag twice. So the Think Tank Airport Navigator. And we will do um, a little section on uh, what's in my bag and what it looks like towards the end. So the Airport Navigator, it's a beautiful bag because for wedding photographers, it has a top opening compartment and it allows you to work out of, to put your camera in, to grab your lens out of, uh, in a really fast and efficient way. So this is a roller bag, it stays on the ground. It's got a good sturdy handle, it's solid all around, it's going to protect your gear and it is excellent for traveling, whether going on an airplane and traveling or whether just using it as your daily day uh, driving bag for your photography. Now, for me, I love this bag for that top loading feature where you open the bag, you pull your camera out, and I work out of it where I change lenses. So I use one body uh, to cover my weddings with, and I have the top loader opened all the time so I can just quickly get out a lens, change it, and pop the other lens back into the bag. This also holds my laptop and all my other bits in there as well, but because it stays on the ground, all I ever have to do is grab the handle and pull it along with me. And I know it's safe, it's by my side. I feel really refreshed at the end of the day because I haven't got those achy shoulders from the bags pulling down on my shoulders who's wearing it all the time. And also the bag, it's security because you can actually lock this bag. It's got little padlocks that you can uh, lock it so no one can get in there and I know it's safe. So whether I'm uh, having a break and I put my cameras in there, I can just put the little padlock on and I know that all the equipment is safe in there. So moving on from the bags, uh, the equipment that I use, 
to uh, today, I actually used the Sony A9 Mark II camera. Uh, now I've used every iteration of this camera, so I started on the uh, the A9 and um, uh, eventually moved up to the Mark II. I think for wedding photographers, the A9 is a brilliant camera. Yes, it's not cheap, but it's robust, it's strong, it does the job, and it's got the frames per second in there for when you do the confetti shots and um, you know things like that. So I, I really do like this camera for wedding photography. It's also quite small and it's quite light as well. Battery wise is, I normally have four batteries, but I've only ever used two batteries for a wedding. So the new Sony batteries, they're really efficient. Uh, and they do last quite a long time as well. My favorite lens of choice is the Sigma 28 millimeter F 1.4 prime lens. So I only use prime lenses. I don't use zoom lenses and I will explain that uh, when we get to the bottom of this list. Uh, so most photographers, most wedding photographers would use a 35 millimeter lens as their main lens. But I just found when I'm using a 35 millimeter, I'm always taking that one step back to get that little bit extra in. And with the Sigma, the 28 millimeter, it's a beautiful lens. It's just that little bit wider. And I can't express how much you will use this lens. It basically lives on the camera for, I would say 80% of the wedding. So that's the main driving lens. Then we've got the Sony 55 millimeter F 1.8, a very small compact 50 millimeter prime. Everyone needs a nifty 50 in their bag. So this is great for doing portrait shots, detail shots, or in the evening dance shots on the fly. So great lens uh, for that, highly recommend uh, that. The Sigma 85mm f1.4 prime lens. So this is their new lens. It's very small, very compact. We've got a beautiful aperture there. And this is beautiful for portraits, for doing those bridal portraits and uh, those uh, bride and groom portraits as well. I also like using it for macro photography, for doing the bouquet and ring shots. And then recently I've added the Sony 135 f1.8 prime lens in. So again, it's just that bit of a, um, a longer reach. It's beautiful for when there's a, a crowd there, when all the guests are mingling with their drinks and I don't really want to get involved with it. I want to stay at a bit of a distance. If I put this on, I can get some really beautiful shots and the bokeh is beautiful. Or maybe I use it for a, a nice portrait shot where I'm lying down on the ground and the bride and groom are sort of walking towards me hand in hand and you can get this super beautiful separation from them and the background with this bokehlicious effect. Okay, so a, a really nice lens to have. And then my flash is the Profoto A1X. So it's an on-camera flash that goes on the top, but it's also got uh, a built-in wireless uh, transceiver in it as well. So I can actually use it off camera uh, for doing some lighting. Uh, again, yes, I know it's a pro photo, it's an expensive flash, but it's the only flash you will ever buy. It will last you forever. And plus it's daylight balanced and you know every single flash that goes off is gonna be an accurate uh, flash. Meaning if you're using this in TTL, it will give you a beautiful rendition of the light onto your subject. So why do I use primes over zooms? Well, the simple answer to this is primes are brighter. So you can see that I've got an f1.4, an f1.8, f1.4. So all my lenses are f1.4 or 1.8. So they're really bright lenses. So let's give a scenario on this. Let's say you had the Sigma 28 millimeter f1.4 prime lens. You had it set to f4 and uh, your shutter speed was at 200 of a second and you took the picture. Then your pal was next to you and say he's got um, a lens that's uh, 
28 to 70 millimeters, and he's also got his at f4. But to get the same looking picture as you, instead of him being at 200th of a second, he's at 100th of a second. And the reason for that is even though you're at the same apertures, his barrel on his lens is twice as long as your barrel on your prime lens. And that's because his is a zoom lens. So his barrel is longer. So that means when light hits the front of it, it takes longer for the light to travel down to the sensor. But also it gets darker as the light is traveling down. So he has to open up to let more light in. So that is another reason why I use primes. They're lighter, they let more light in, they're better in low light situations. So camera saying, so you know, what is that magic setting for your camera and uh, how does it all work? Well, I'm gonna do a spoiler alert. There is no magical settings, but we can certainly try and help you out. It's all too easy to set your camera to A mode, to uh, you know aperture priority mode or fully auto mode and hope basically for the best that you get the shot. Now, I recommend shooting in manual. Um, it's gonna give you a much more consistent workflow from start to finish. So by this, Let's take a room uh, as a scenario. You've got the bride um, getting ready shots and you stick your camera into aperture priority. You go in there, you're taking all the shots. Now, what's gonna happen is the light changes in there, your shutter speed is going up and down. If you move the, the camera to a different area of the room, again, it completely changes your settings because of the different uh, light that's coming in there. If you're in manual, you know in that room that once you dial in your settings, that's it. All the pictures are consistent. It's the same look all the way across. And when I say working in manual, I'm not just talking about dialing in your aperture and your shutter speed, I'm actually talking about your white balance as well. So I think it's really important to actually uh, work in manual white balance. So some uh, photographers cover their weddings shooting wide open all day. This refers to shooting at its lowest aperture, say f1.4 or uh, f2.8, whatever's the lowest aperture on that lens. As a guide, you can use the following settings um, to try and get you through the day. So this is what I would suggest. A single person, so if you're taking a, a photo of the bride, then f1.4 to 2.8. You can get some lovely separation in the background, like you can see on the image on the left there, a beautiful shot. If you're doing a couple though, you need to open the aperture up a bit more because we need both the couples to be in focus. So therefore, uh, 3.2 to f4, I would suggest for a couple. You could even use f4. 5.6 for a couple, but 3.2 to f4 for a couple. For the main group shots, I would definitely suggest uh, f8 because we want everyone nice and sharp. We want to be able to see all those people's faces. Now, don't, um, don't get the wrong idea with your lens. Say it goes up to f 22 and you think, well, if I go to f22, then everyone's gonna be sharp. Brilliant, let's go for that doesn't work like that. So, you know, you can go really high up to f22, but sometimes the images can be a little bit soft. So all lenses have a sweet spot, and that sweet spot is generally in the middle of your f-stop, which is roughly around f8 to f16. So I would suggest f8 for all your group shots. So family shots, so the family group shots, and that's going to be around about, you know, uh, five to six people in there. And I would stick with f5.6 for that. And that way you still get some nice separation from the background, but all the family are still nice and sharp and in focus. So single people, f1.4, couples, 
F4, main group shots, F8, family shots, 5.6. So after covering over 500 weddings to simplify my settings, I finally come to realize what works, what's the best settings um, for, for me, basically. So these can definitely work for you. So metering mode is center weighted. It concentrates on the center of the frame, but also it takes into account 20% around the center. And this will give you a much more accurate exposure. Now, most cameras, when they come, they look at meeting, metering the, the whole frame and that's all well, but a camera doesn't see color. A camera uh, basically just looks at the darkest and the lightest part and it tries to make 18% gray. Now let's go back to the good old days where we all shot film. Well, all film cameras was only ever center weighted, right? So they, uh, they concentrated on the middle and then they also took 20% uh, from the middle around there into the equation. So if you was to take a picture of this couple with all the branches around, so we've got the light coming through the top of the branches and we've got the dark areas around the bottom. If it was looking at the whole scene, it would probably make this scene a lot brighter than what it was on the camera. But if we use center weighted, then it's going to look at the couple and then look at 20% around them and you're going to get a much more accurate exposure. And it's going to help you out in the long run to give you a much consistency across the board with your photos. When it comes to editing your photos, you won't be adjusting your exposure as much and your blacks uh, and your highlights as much it's going to make the editing workflow a lot easier for you. So the drive mode, I have this in continuous low. Now the reason I have it in continuous low is because with continuous low, I can just tap the shutter button and take one picture. But if I need to take a couple of pictures like doing the confetti shot or the bride's walking towards me uh, or she's walking down the aisle, I can just hold the shutter button and it will can do a continuous burst of shots but not too many where it's going to fill up my buffer on the camera so I have to wait to take that all being um, you know the groom turning around to do that glance at his bride but maybe I can't take that because the buffer's full on my camera because I've got it in continuous high uh, and I need to wait for the buffer to clear so uh, I have mine set to continuous low so I know the camera will always keep up with what I want to take and not what the camera um, thinks that it needs to take, if that makes sense. So focus mode, we've talked about this, uh, continuous autofocus. Continuous autofocus, if you had a single um, focus selected, now again, when the bride's walking down, she's walking towards you. So if you lock onto her, take a picture, you have to release again and then lock onto her and take a picture. For one, that's gonna take a lot of time to keep locking onto a subject. Subjects are always moving in weddings, then no one just stays still. So I would highly recommend continuous autofocus. And what I would do is separate your focus from your shutter button. I would highly recommend you to do bat button focusing. That way, your thumb can use the bat button focusing. So you just hold the bat button focus button. It will focus onto, say, the bride walking down the aisle and it would keep locked onto her all the time and that way your finger is just on the shutter button taking the images that you want to take. Also when she gets up to the top, when she's stationary and she's not moving, if you're not moving let your finger off the back button focus, there's no need to keep focusing on her because she's not moving, she's staying in that place. So now you can concentrate on keep taking the pictures. When you're in a very low light scenario, if the camera's always got to focus 
on the subject, you might find that the lens keeps hunting to uh, get the shot and uh, it's, it's not always accurate, especially when you're in a very dimly lit church. So my recommendation is to be in continuous autofocus. It works really well. ISO, again, manually set. If you're outside, set your ISO to uh, 200. If it's a, a sunny day, if it's an overcast day, normally about 320, 400. Uh, and if you're inside, if it's in the evening, and it's, it's you know, uh, like a dim lit hotel, then you're going to be at ISO 3200. Uh, very rarely do I go over 3200. Uh, that normally works for um, very dimly lit hotels, barns uh, and so forth as well. Don't forget you may be using your flash and uh, it's a balance between the ISO and the flash. White balance, white balance, I mean auto is okay. Uh, nowadays these digital cameras, your auto white balance does get it pretty accurate but this is where I was going before when I was talking about uh, the way that light changes coming into a room. I mean, if you're in a bride's prep room, you've got daylight coming in and they've got the tungsten bulbs on and um, the makeup artist has got her lamp on as well. Those are all different variations of light and the camera can get really confused. And you can see when you put it into your editing software, you can see this massive fluctuation of white balance going from image to image. So I would highly recommend shooting in Kelvin and you get a really good understanding for the Kelvin scale when you use it all the time. I mean, if you're outside daylight 5800 Kelvin, you get some beautiful colors, some beautiful skin tones. You could shoot all day with that. Uh, if you're in um, a hotel with their lights have got a very orange look to them, then you're at uh, 300 Kelvin for, um, for them. You know, once you're dialing these into your camera settings, then it will really make sense. You'll start to walk into a room, look at the light, and you'll start to realize and understand what Kelvin you need for that lighting scenario. So myself, I don't even think about it now. I just walk into a room, I see the light there, and I change my Kelvin. Sometimes I don't even realize what I've changed it to. It's, it's that embedded into me now. But I do know when I come to do my editing, my images are all consistent. So whichever room I've been in, the light is the same, the colors are all the same. So it just makes my whole workflow process a lot faster. And this is definitely what we need to get to as wedding photographers, especially in the heat of the season when we've got so many weddings to, uh, to edit. I mean, we're coming up now to the heat of the season. I've got 38 weddings. Um, now, when you're doing 38 weddings, remember one wedding is equal to five days work. I have to get that wedding, I've got to turn it around, I've got to edit it, I've got to send it to the client, and then I've got to do the album. Then I'll probably be going doing another wedding before I finish that one. So if you haven't got a good workflow, you can get yourself really backed up and get yourself really flustered. Uh, and then that's not enjoyable. Remember, we're doing this because we love photography. Um, we we love weddings. We're not doing weddings because we want money. I, I hope you're not. I mean, weddings can be a very unenjoyable business if you're just doing it for money. You should be doing weddings because you love the moment. You love the, the happiness there that everyone's enjoying themselves. You love that opportunity of being able to, you know, create those memories for the couple that are going to last forever. So that is why you should be a wedding photographer. It should be because of your passion for that and not just about you want to earn money from it. You can earn money from being a portrait photographer or uh, an event photographer or anything. So, um, you know, uh, it's definitely an enjoyable job if that's the direction you want to go. And so this is an example of light as well. Now, 
take this scenario in the hotel behind the couple you've got daylight coming in from the window and then at the side of the couple you've also got the hotel lights which again are a different color if we took a picture of the couple just with the hotel lights if we set our kelvin to the hotel lights that would be 3000 kelvin and what would happen is the outside lights would go very blue okay but because we expose for the lights that are indoors you would lose all that contrast to the seats and the curtains and the drapes as well because the couples they're not actually lit with any light at the front of them if i was to turn off the the light that i'm using they're actually in darkness because they're being lit from behind and they're being lit very dimly from um, the front so what i did is we put uh, a Neo 2, so it's a road light, a Neo 2, very small handheld LED light. It is perfect for wedding photographers. It's very portable, you can just stick it in your bag. Uh, it's not, not going to take up too much space. Now I've put this on a lighting stand and then I've angled it to the couple and I've balanced the light. So the Kelvin on this light, because you can actually adjust the color temperature is matched to the hotel's light, but ever so slightly warmed up to match the outside light as well. So that way now I've got the couple nicely lit and you can see from the picture on the right hand side, that's a nice picture. I mean, uh, you know, they're evenly lit all around. You can see their faces, the dress, you can see the bouquet. We can see all the contrast to the drapes, to this lovely seat where they're sitting. So again, this is, this is a real wedding. Um, this is a, a wedding that I did at the hotel with the couple there. Now they didn't book me for long. I think I was booked for about five hours. So they got married, uh, we did the ceremony, we did um, some drink shots, we did, um, we did the group shots outside and then light was fading outside and it was like right quick come on let's do some portrait shoots outside we did the portrait shoots outside then we ended inside this took seconds to set up uh, i just went upstairs i put the light on i asked the couple to sit there remember because it's constant light as soon as you can turn it on you can see where the light is so i could see the couple i adjusted the brightness onto the couple that I thought was accurate. And then I also adjusted the Kelvin so it sort of matched the environment in and outside. And then I just stood back, took the picture, uh, that was with an 85 millimeter lens, and then that's it. Uh, it, you know, it was virtually right out of camera. Uh, there was nothing really done to that image. It was ready to go. And the best thing in the world is when you turn your camera round to the couple and show them the back of the camera with the image there to give them that little bit of reassurance. Uh, they absolutely love that. So that's it for uh, this section. The, the next section will be on the workflow leading up to the wedding.